Hi guys, welcome back. My name is Jason and I'm a penetration tester here at Predator Today we're going to be providing an introduction to the OWASP Top 10, what it is, why it was created and how it can help you focus in your efforts when you're securing your web applications. So firstly, what is OWASP or the Open Web Application Security Project? And well, OWASP is a not-for-profit organization that's been around for almost two decades now, and it can be thought of as an open source repository for all things web application security. So everything from research, methodologies, tools and technologies that aim to educate and aid those looking to secure their web applications. And um, one thing to note about OWASP is that it's completely community driven. So there's room for anyone with a passion to contribute to their work, which you'll often see through their own GitHub. So that brings us on to the OWASP Top 10, which is arguably OWASP's most famous resource and for very good reason. Uh, so the OWASP Top 10 is an awareness document. I mean, I don't like calling it a standard, but I think it's often thought of as a standard. And this document is backed by data collected from a range of application security professionals. And it highlights the most critical web application security risks. And the criticality of these risks is based on a range of factors, including how easy they are for a bad actor to detect, uh, their exploitability, and the potential impact of their exploitation. And the real purpose of the OWASP Top 10 was to focus the efforts of developers, IT managers, and anyone who works with web applications on the major threats to reduce the success of, of the attackers. Um, Testing an application for OWASP Top 10 has become widely adopted as a baseline and has even been mandated in certain areas of compliance. So, for example, if you're in the UK, the NHS, uh, NHS's DSP toolkit will ask if your web application has been tested against the OWASP Top 10. As you can see here, the OWASP Top 10 is currently still on the 2017 version, but, that new, uh, but a new version is in the works and should be dropping within the next year or so. So stay tuned for that. So let's take a brief look at each of the top 10, starting with injection. And now these security risks are in order of criticality. So based on the research, injection was found to be the greatest threat to a web application security. And injection at basic level is where untrusted user input, so data provided by a user, is able to escape the context that it was intended for and execute or manipulate an application's code, commands, or queries. So, for example, with a SQL injection, which is probably the most famous kind, a search parameter, for example, usually used for searching for items with a particular name, may insecurely take whatever input is given and place this within the SQL query directly. So if this input is not properly validated or the SQL query hasn't been parameterized, an attacker could, take this, uh, could place SQL code into that vulnerable parameter and rewrite the syntax of the SQL query, which could allow them to manipulate and exfiltrate data on the SQL database. SQL isn't the only type of injection though, so there are, you know, you may have injection like LDAP injection uh, for Active Directory integrations, SMTP injection, OS uh, you know, command line injection. Um, injection could basically happen anywhere, use input is accepted during like some interface with a different technology. So it's definitely something to be looking out for. So moving on to broken authentication and broken authentication refers to the poor implementation of authentication mechanisms and also includes insecure session management as well. So perfecting authentication is often a lot more difficult than it first appears and an attacker will often chain a few deficiencies together to obtain the desired results. So an example of this is say you have a, a login form with no rate limiting control so there's nothing to stop an attacker from executing an automated attack such as a brute force attack. An attacker could go through an unlimited number of credential pairs, potentially unimpeded. Um, and if you do uh, then throw into the mix a poor password policy, which permits users to sign up with weak passwords, you know, if you're not enforcing um, stronger password parameters, then, you know, and users can uh, use whatever passwords they like, then you're going to get weak passwords. An attacker will, could then go through the, through the list of, with a brute force and could potentially obtain valid credentials um, using those two deficiencies alone. And if there's then no uh, two-factor authentication enforced, the attacker could then compromise the account without any second factor check blocking them from uh, gaining access. So uh, a defense in-depth approach is important when it comes to ensuring authentication is as secure as, as it can be. So making sure, um, you know, 
all the security best practices are implemented will make it more difficult for an attacker to uh, to exploit your authentication mechanisms and your session management um, setup. Heading on to sensitive data exposure, and uh, this risk is focused around the state of data in transit and at rest. So sensitive data at all times, whether it's moving across the network or stored on disk, needs to be sufficiently obfuscated. So this could be something as basic as ensuring sensitive data, sensitive form data is sent over HTTPS instead of HTTP, make sure it has TLS. Um, encrypting it, or ensuring uh, passwords are sorted and hashed with a strong algorithm before being placed in a database, so pretty basic stuff, um, instead of committing the ultimate sin of storing passwords in plain text. Um, so the impact of sensitive data exposure is the easiest to see because there are like so many breached uh, data dumps with millions of assets freely available um, to anyone online, and these dumps contain passwords that have been compromised, uh, many of which are likely still in use by the owner somewhere. Um, all of this is due to poor protection of sensitive data when there's been a uh, bit of data breach. So, um, if if you've got any uh, you know passwords stored in plain text or we're using MD5 as the the hashing algorithm of no salt, then um, these might be easily crackable or easily obtainable, and you know. You could use these passwords elsewhere as well if the user's using the same passwords for multiple different uh, services uh, it could allow an attacker to um, gain access to all the other accounts so uh, it's definitely something to be aware of so quickly moving on to xml external entities or xxe for short and this can arise in applications that rely on an xml parser um, so if the xml parser accepts um, xml in some form from an untrusted source so this could be via an upload or directly inputted or via any input where the xml eventually reaches the xml processor so where the xml processor still has the document type definitions enabled which is where the entities are defined um, an entity could be created that calls a local file or even calls a remote file and stores it on the server, for example. Um, an XXE uh, predominantly leads to data exfiltration, but can also pose other risks such as uh, denial of service. Now on to broken access control, and um, broken access control occurs where users are able to access resources or functionality that are outside of their permissions. So a popular textbook example of this would be uh, for a vulnerability such as an insecure direct object reference or IDOR. And an IDOR arises where an application uses untrusted uh, user supplied input to access an object directly. So say we have an application that uses a Git request parameter such as an ID value to determine the account that is shown to the user. Uh, the user can then change the ID number uh, to an arbitrary value to access another user's account, essentially breaching um, horizontal access control. And the impacts of this can be uh, quite obvious. Um, so it can lead to compromised accounts, uh, data theft, uh, use of func functionality reserved for uh, different user roles, etc. Um, so it's just about making sure that you know users or unauthenticated or authenticated users can't um, can't stretch past their permitted permissions. So number six on the list is security misconfiguration. And um, security misconfiguration is a broad category of issues that can affect any level of the application stack, from configuring um, the configuration of the network infrastructure all the way to the web application settings themselves in packages such as WordPress. Um, and misconfigurations can um, include leaving unneeded network ports open, um, overly verbose error messages, uh, not removing default accounts or passwords, and um, you know lack of correctly set security headers so you know a, a real range of of different issues and of, of course the impact of this could be extensive it really depends on what the misconfiguration is uh, more often than not it's uh, misconfigurations um, misconfigurations are more the enabler and are chained with uh, the exploitation of other vulnerabilities no one to cross-site scripting or xss and cross-site scripting is a client-side vulnerability which can allow an attacker to inject client-side scripts into other users' web browsers when, when they come and um, view the exploited web page. 
So cross-site scripting comes in three variants. So we have uh, reflected, which is the non-persistent form of cross-site scripting. And so the payload may be reflected in the subsequent web page, but will not be stored, uh, say, in a database of some kind. Uh, this kind of cross-site scripting will typically need to be chained with other techniques to get the victim to the vulnerable web page. Uh, and this can be done with something like a phishing link or like an email phishing link. Um, next, we have stored cross-site scripting. And as it sounds, it's where uh, cross-site scripting payload is stored. So for example, say a web, web application loads comments on a page from a database and there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability present in the comment form an attacker could inject the payload into the comments so that when someone views the published comments the payload is pulled from the database and executes in the victim's browser. DOM-based um, cross-site scripting involves injecting cross-site scripting, uh, injecting the cross-site scripting payload somewhere within the document object model where the malicious user input can be executed in the JavaScript or modifies the JavaScript to behave in an unexpected way. So cross-site scripting can uh, lead to theft of data, credential cookies, and can be used um, could be made more potent with other security deficiencies such as uh, poorly implemented uh, cross-origin resource sharing policy, for example. So we now reach insecure deserialization. And serialized objects are created where you want to save the current state of an object in your application. So say, say you want to store it on, uh, on disk for later or you want to send it to an API elsewhere. That object is serialized into a binary representation that can be uh, later unpacked to retrieve the object in its safe state. So as you can imagine, the insecurity comes from where um, the serialized object is deserialized. Because if an attacker um, is able to serialize an object and the web application accepts untrusted uh, serialized objects, then the attacker can potentially inject malicious data to get the application to behave in unintended ways uh, when this deserialization takes place. And this can lead to uh, denial of service, uh, privilege escalation, and more critically, uh, remote code execution. So moving on to using components with known vulnerabilities, and this is something we're all familiar with. Um, we're told to keep everything patched and up to date, and the reason for it is to make sure that all the components have the latest security patches they need. So it's very easy to drop the ball on this one if you don't have a clear and up-to-date understanding of what components are in use in your web application. Um, and this leads them to like uh, these components being forgotten about and um, unpatched, which means that if a uh, CVE or vulnerability does manifest and your components are running a version that is affected, it could be sitting there for a long time and could potentially be exploitable. Now, um, Obviously, the big problem is you know keeping uh, version control, so that might become an issue when you're trying to keep everything patched. Um, but keeping everything with the latest security um, security updates is is incredibly important uh, where possible. So making sure um, you know what components are in use and making sure that they are supported by a vendor and um, where possible um, are patched. Um, this will reduce the attack surface uh, for this risk. So last but not least, we arrive at insufficient logging and monitoring. And this is where the critical auditable events are not being properly logged and or monitored. So for example, if you have no authentication logs, you may have no idea whether um, your, your authentication mechanisms are under attack. You'll have no idea whether um, an attack has been successful and you probably won't know if anything serious has happened until it's too late. So. Um, you need to be keeping logs of anything critical uh, to the application, such as transactions and any custom functionality that could be a target for abuse. All of this should be logged. But having logged is just half of the half of the solution. So you could have the perfect logs, which would tell you everything you need to know. Um, but this would all be for nothing if you uh, weren't monitoring these logs some, in in some way. Uh, so ensuring that the um, there is some monitoring going on, which can this can be aided by how the logs are presented or uh, what information is flagged to be monitored, um, might just save the application from compromise. Um, so I'll leave you with this statistic from IBM, and it highlights that the average time to identify the security breach um, to identify a security breach in 2020 was uh, 228 days. Um, and uh, just think about what an attacker could do in uh, 228 days if they held persistence on, on the web application undetected. 
uh, just some food for four. So that's it from me, guys. I hope this has uh, given you a basic understanding of the OS Top 10. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about how Protect can help you secure your web application, uh, please do get in touch. We offer web application penetration testing uh, that covers the top 10 and beyond. So that's all from me. Wishing you all a great day and thanks for watching.